Hallelujah. Welcome to Soul Restoration Ministry. Guess what? It is a few days after Easter. Probably the most holiest moment in all of mankind. When Jesus Christ, well, when God came in the form of flesh and to do one thing only, and that is to die for the sins of mankind. And I love how Jesus Christ went out in style. Because on that last breath, that last moment on the cross, he said, it is finished. Well, what was finished? Number one, the saving of that which was lost. And number two, destroying the works of the devil. That was finished. So with that said, I call it the Christian Super Bowl, right? The Super Bowl of all Christianity, where Jesus Christ was able to defeat the prince of this world. So now that he's been defeated, you know the results. Everything that you do in the name of Jesus Christ, you should have victory. And that is the portion that you believe that you have in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Listen, once again, thank you for joining us. I hope you had a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Easter service and that you were blessed by the word of God that was taught in this church or in another church that you went to. So God bless you. Why don't we pray and get into the word a little bit. Father, we thank you so much for this time, this moment. We thank you for this, this very season that we're in. May the impact of what you did for us on the cross of Calvary live with us now and beyond. May this moment that we just went through, the Passover, the understanding and the revelation of the Passover be with us continuously. We give you the praise and as we even learn more and elaborate on the effect of this thing, we pray, oh God, that you give us an understanding in Jesus' name and somebody shall say, Amen. So listen to this. Listen very carefully. Bible says, he died for our sins before the foundations of the world. So before Genesis chapter 1, amazingly, if you think about scripture, it's almost like God knew that sin will happen. Lucifer will betray him. And he had already made provision for it in the realm of the spirit. I love that. When I read that verse in scripture particularly, that tells me that nothing surprises my God. It wasn't like Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve ate the apple or the fruit of knowledge of good and evil that it caught God off by surprise. Because the Bible said even before the earth itself was created, the foundation of the earth, Jesus Christ had already died. So we were now catching up with that spiritual reality. Jesus had died before the foundation of the word, okay, of the earth. So now Adam and Eve, who came out of the earth, clay, right? They were just fulfilling something because they weren't surprising God anyway. I love the message of God. Now listen very carefully though. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. The Bible says Jesus Christ, will, God will come by the cool of the day and then he will go. All right? God will come by the cool of the day and he will go. All right. After they sinned, that was when we saw the value of sacrifice. In Genesis chapter 3, we see this man called Abel, who, would I say, maybe he stumbled upon sacrifice, but whatever you want to call it, he did. There was his brother Cain who sacrificed fruits, vegetables, you know, the good of the land. Abel sacrificed an animal which was bloodshed. And by, by, by default, we found out that God just likes bloodshed. Then you read further into scripture and we get to, uh, let me just say Genesis chapter 6. Actually, let's go to Genesis chapter 4 first. And we find out by default through another man called Enoch. We find out that, hmm, okay, if you walk closely with God, God will eventually take you up to the heavenlies. So the Bible said Enoch walked with God and he was taken up to heaven. So now by these two fathers, right, we find out through Abel that he likes blood sacrifice. Isn't it amazing that nothing else occurred after that sin than sacrifice? An animal was killed and the fur used to cover the sin or the exposure or the nakedness of Adam and Eve, sacrifice of an animal. Abel, sacrifice of an animal. That tells you the relevance of sacrifice to God. Genesis chapter 4. Now we see the importance of walking with God. Because as Enoch walked with God, he was taken up to heaven. That's a clue. Now we go to the Genesis chapter 6. This is the story of Noah. Guess what? Noah found grace. I mean, we're talking about preeminence, right? The things that matter. Sacrifice. Walking with God. And then the next thing is Genesis chapter 6, where we talk about he found what Noah found grace. Child of God, you have found grace. 
The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 17, that Jesus Christ brought grace and truth. Noah found grace. And when Noah found grace, Noah understood the value of obedience. And because he obeyed God and built that ark, Noah also discovered the power of covenant. So now we have what? Sacrifice. We have walking with God. We have finding grace. And the next thing we also find is what? The power of God's covenant. Because God gave him a covenant that I will not destroy the earth with rain anymore. And he made that covenant in him in Genesis somewhere around chapter 8. But guess what though? Guess something amazingly. When you read Revelation chapter 4, the Bible says that the throne of God is there and the throne of God is surrounded by something called a rainbow. And the rainbow is designed to remember, let God remember the covenant he had with Noah. Now, when we get to Genesis chapter 12, I love this. There comes a man called Abraham. And Abraham is, the sign, is, is seen as the father of what? Faith. There are eight authors, I believe, in the book of Genesis. Five of them were built by this Abraham guy because he understood the concept of acknowledging. He understood the, 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 the value of, of, of seeing a place where you meet or encounter God. And that is what Abraham did. He discovered what? Faith. And then the other thing that Abraham also did was in Genesis chapter 22, Abraham realized that God said he himself will provide himself a lamp. That was a revelation concerning what? Easter. God said, don't sacrifice Isaac, but I will provide myself as a lamb for the sacrifice. What an insight. Now, once again, from Genesis chapter 2, remember in Genesis chapter 2 there, God will come, speak with Adam and Eve, and he will go. But something strange happens after you cross Genesis chapter 3. It's almost as if God wants to tabernacle. God wants to tabernacle. Listen to that word. God wants to tabernacle with man. God wants to live with man. So then there comes the great Moses, that mighty prophet. And that mighty statesman, prophet, whatever he was, that mighty man of God saw the pattern. And there was what? A tabernacle. God dwelling inside man. Well, you keep going, you keep going. And then you come across another man who was called David. And look at what David did. David valued the tabernacle so much, he just decided he's going to build a permanent structure. He said, I will build God a house. He somehow tapped into the idea that God wants to dwell with man. And he said, I'll make it permanent by building God a house. The tabernacle was something that you could break up and move as you go. Wow, Jesus Christ is not going to be on, uh, outdone. So you know what Jesus Christ said? He came and in the New Testament era said, I will break this temple, I will bring this sanctuary down, and I'll build it in three days. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ knows better than all these people that I've mentioned. But what did Jesus Christ do? He said, I will build something else. But guess what that temple was? It was you. It was you. Now we've gone from dwelling in tabernacle, dwelling in, uh, in, in the sanctuary, you know, in the temple that Moses and, you know, in the temple that Solomon built. Now, Jesus Christ saying, I'm no longer going to live in even in that anymore. I'm going to dwell inside your heart. Think about the privilege. Jesus dwells inside you. There's no more temple thing. It's inside you. You are the temple. How special are you? Sometimes when I sit and I think about if I was maybe born on this side of Calvary where Jesus Christ was not yet there or on that side of Calvary where Jesus Christ had died, I find myself so grateful that as a believer, I am on this side of Calvary after his death. That should be something that you cherish forever. But I want us to talk a little bit more about this thing, okay? And I want you to see the vastness of your God and what they did. So let's go to Colossians chapter, Colossians chapter 1. Now, I fully, fully, fully understand that you've just come through as Easter. And you probably heard about the, 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 the crucifixion and all that. So I want to just build up on that a little bit. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says something very powerful. The Bible says, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, let's read from verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God? Jesus Christ. He is the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Every bacteria. No, well, let me go further. 
every virus you see, COVID virus, all these things that we talk about. We talked about COVID-19. So I don't know. I'm not a, a biologist, but maybe there was COVID-1 to 18 before this 19. Everything you can imagine, every germ, virus, microscope, not visible, whatever it is, everything was created by this Jesus. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. This is your Jesus Christ. He created everything. And for somebody who has such authority to humble himself and say, although I am not sin, I will become sin. That is unique. Let me share something with you. Judas played around with the opportunity that he had. There were 12 who were called by Jesus to become his disciples. Judas was one of them. He was around it. He lived around it. He ate with it. He did everything with it. But he was distracted by money. At least the devil distracted him from my money, if you want to call it that. And he missed, he missed his opportunity. We're at a place right now where I think you would agree with me that the world is getting darker. Okay, in the country where we live right now, there's mass shooting every hour, every week, if you want there to be one, right? It's, it's, it's everywhere. There is doom and gloom. And I'm telling you that we need Jesus Christ more than ever. So if there's anything you can do to serve your God and serve him with, with, with reverence, I think you should be able to just do that and give him your full hearted attention. Because what is sad is that you wake up one day like Judas did. There's a scripture where it says Judas after Jesus Christ died, realized that he had shed innocent blood. And he said, for what? For 30 shekels of silver? I have shed innocent blood? And he went back to the Pharisees to try to, I guess, refund their money to them. And they said, what shall we have to do with this? And the shame of it caused Judas to kill himself. Listen, I'm telling you, you've been around church. You've been around the Holy Ghost. You've been around the things of God. At least you've heard it. You see it on bumper car stickers. Please, please, please pay attention to what this Jesus Christ is trying to tell you before it gets too late where you realize that, oh my God, all this time, this man shed his blood for me and I didn't even recognize it. May that not be your portion in the name of Jesus. But I love what I love. I love how the Trinity works. It's incredible. Such a powerful God. The Bible says in Luke chapter 1 verse 35 you have to you have to we have to read this okay so we're going to luke chapter 1 verse 35 and we're going to learn something very unique here and i'm going to turn there quickly okay luke chapter 1 verse 35 matthew mark luke and i'm going to verse 35 here the bible says that the angel answered and said unto her which is mary the holy ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. What has personally been an amazing revelation I've received is that the Holy Ghost is so powerful that it took the creator of the universe and converted this thing, which is called God, into a fetus. Think about that. Think about that. Think about that. That same Holy Ghost is the one that Jesus Christ promised will come into you when you believe him. So think about the power that is a full effect of the resurrection. He didn't leave you with something short. Jesus Christ knew that the only reason why he, as the son of God, the creator, without him was nothing made, could come onto this earth and succeed as a human being was by the help of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost converted him to fetus so that he could be born. He said, listen, 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 listen. Peter, James, John, tarry, tarry in Jerusalem and pray and don't do anything until the Holy Ghost has fallen upon you. Because your Savior did not want to leave you with something less than what he had for you to be able to do this Christianity. You have it. If you ask, you shall receive it, what, liberally. If that is the effect of the cross, amen. 
Amen. I hope you're saying with me at home, you are in. After coming back from this Passion Week that we went through, I hope you have an understanding of what legacy, what legacy Easter left for you. You can be filled and imbibed with the power of the Holy Ghost. Okay, and that is, and that is, and that is, and that is, that is, that is just something that is, that is, that is unique. Okay, now I want us to look at look at the extent of this thing. Okay, Jesus said something in Scripture which is very interesting. Um, he was having a conversation with this guy called Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to him and he's asking him all these questions, just asking him all these questions. And Jesus Christ made two references in the Old Testament that you need to be aware of. Jesus Christ talked about the rock. Okay. He described, he described the rock that was following the Israelites. If you know your scriptures, you realize that there was a rock that Moses actually stretched forth his rod and hit right now this same rock the bible said it will break in two and will give water we now know from the new testament that jesus christ was kind of dis de 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 describing himself in a way if you want to put it that way okay now there's another analogy which he used which always baffles me but i think i'm beginning to understand it now every time you think about snake in the bible you think about the devil right the serpent that went to go and deceive eve and then Eve ate the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There's nothing good about the serpent in the Bible. But something amazing happens in the description of Jesus. Jesus Christ said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. But then he used the analogy of a snake in the Old Testament. You know what I'm talking about. There was a judgment that fell upon the people of Israel. And when that judgment fell, Snakes were coming to bite the Israelites. But then God commanded his servant Moses and said, put a bronze snake on a stick and lift it up. And when they look on that snake, the bronze one, they shall be healed. How is it that the snake, which is not a good thing, was able to deceive Adam and Eve? But now the same snake is now bringing salvation to some people who are hurting from bites. This is why. You see, Jesus Christ was trying to prove a point. The Bible said, he who became sin knew not sin. He who became sin knew not sin. So on that day on the cross, if you looked at Jesus, you would say the Romans have found him guilty. And he himself said he was bearing the sin of mankind. So it was almost like he was that snake. If you look at him, it's like, ah, this guy, this thing is evil. Jesus Christ is, is, being, is being looked as evil. But then if you look deeper, it's almost like the form of sin that you're looking at is giving you deliverance. Catch the revelation there. The, sin, the snake now is bringing what? Deliverance. That is why the Bible says it, 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 it comes across as the appearance, right? The appearance, the appearance of what? Of sin. The appearance of sin. You look at him, but at the same time, you're looking at this sinful man on the cross and he's bringing you salvation. So, please, I'm begging you. When we get to heaven, you're not going to be able to say, Jesus Christ didn't know what I went through. As a matter of fact, I think when I watch some of these historical movies and the context, the Bible says there's no new thing under the sun. Every sin that you are thinking of, it probably existed back in the day. I always say that the only thing this is difference between us and the old world is technology. Technology has improved. But what has technology done? Technology has also accelerated sin and goodness. Technology has just made the world faster. That's all it is. I'm a child of the 1970s, and I remember growing up in the 80s. Back in the day, what you had to do was to go and write the letter, then you write the letter, then you have to go and get an envelope, then you have to go and get a stamp, and then you have to you have to basically, you know, you know, go and post it. And then three weeks later, maybe your letter will get to the United States. And then and then the person will read it, and then they will have to respond another three weeks later. So just communication between one person and another content to the other, maybe it took about maybe a month and a half or something. Well, what did technology do? Now I just hit WhatsApp, it goes. I just hit send on my email and it goes. But the emotions behind the letter is still conveyed. 
That's what technology did. It did accelerated our access to things or how things process. So do you think that there was fornication in the old world? Absolutely. Do you think there was adultery in the old world? Absolutely. They had brothels in those days. Come on, guys. This is the Roman Empire. They had drugs. They had, I mean, they were reveling. Everything you can imagine, murder, whatever sin you can imagine now was happening then. So Jesus Christ was tempted because when he would walk through the gallows streets of Jerusalem, he would see things. He was not, he was not, I don't know, he was not some statue. He was a living human being who could see things. But he resisted temptation. And that power is what he is saying, I have given unto you. That by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, you will be able to resist what I will call the devil. I love the fathers of faith. They do things and they were able to achieve things, which is, which is just so unique, which is so unique. So let's look at one of those fathers, shall we? And that will be our father, Abraham. So let's go to Abraham and talk about, and let's talk about Easter from the context of Abraham, the context of Abraham. Remember what I said, tabernacle, dwelling in the presence of God, okay? David realized that I need to make this dwelling permanent. So he said, I want to build a temple. And Jesus Christ comes and he says, I'll do it better. I'm just not going to restrict myself to some, some stones, but I'm going to actually build on lively stones, which is your heart. And that is a good thing. So let's go to Genesis chapter 22. And let me read some few verses for you. Okay. So 22, Genesis chapter 22, verse 2 says, And, and God said, Take now thy son Abraham, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. Boy, that's a big ask. This man had been praying for 25 years to receive a child, and he finally got it. And God comes in and says, hey, give me your son. I, 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 I applaud Abraham for one thing. Even if it was a very hard thing to do, he just decided that he would obey. Listen, your life can become prophetic. Your life can be a message to a lot of people. God is not surprised by anything, as I shared. Even the death on the cross of Jesus Christ was not a surprise to him. It happened before the foundations of the world. He knew about it. What you're going through is not a surprise. In the midst of what you're going through, what he's asking you, he's not ignorant. He's just asking you to be what? Obedient. So here we go. Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him, Isaac and his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, does that sound familiar? On the third day, there's a lot of third days going on. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place far off. And Abraham said unto his young man, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again unto you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they went both of them together. Seven, this is critical. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father, remember, only son, and said, My father, and he said, here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? Where is what? The lamb. Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Now, verse 8 is so profound. The Bible says, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Now, listen to me very carefully. If you're not careful, you will think that maybe Abraham was thinking about something in the thicket. But you have to understand something. At the time when Abraham was saying this thing, there was no lamb hiding in a thicket somewhere. So he probably had a prophetic insight to understand that God literally will provide himself a lamb. Do you understand that? God will provide himself a lamb. God himself will become the lamb. God will provide himself a lamb, himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them what? Together. Nine. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. 
So verse 8 is an expression of what? Faith. Verse 8 is a prophetic declaration. Abraham just knew that God will provide himself as a lamb. Doesn't that resonate into 2,023 years ago when Jesus came on the scene and he became the sacrificial what lamb? God just said, just did the circumstance where a man who wanted a sandal desperately and loved that son was willing to give him up as an offering. Likewise, he's saying, I have a son. His name is Jesus. But this Jesus is actually myself providing myself as a lamb for sacrifice. And that is what he did. My, 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 my. The obedience of Abraham touched God's heart. So look at what the Bible says in verse 15. The Bible says, this is incredible. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. For because thou hast done this thing, he have caught into the revelation that I will provide myself a lamb. Because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Ladies and gentlemen, the revelation that God, from verse 8, okay, will provide himself, God will provide himself a son, a lamb. God will provide himself a lamb for the offering brought about one of the most powerful declarations of blessings in mankind. Listen, if you can catch the revelation of who Jesus Christ is in your life, I bet you that heaven will make declarations like this over you without even your conscious knowledge. You will be blessed beyond your wild imagination. Jesus is key. Jesus is critical. Jesus is necessary. When Abraham caught it, look at what happened. Ah, there's another man in your Bible, Moses. Now, Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 has discovered the lamb. We get to the days of Moses. Moses might not have understood the lamb as well as what maybe Abraham did. But Moses saw the effect of the blood of the lamb. He had seen the miraculous power of God. We're talking about the river now turning into blood. We're talking about darkness happening in Egypt that was so dark that people couldn't even see their face. We're talking about locusts. Miracles, 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 lies, ticks, whatever you want to call it. But despite all the miracles, the one miracle <laughs> that brought liberation to the people of God was what? The blood of the lamb on doorposts when the angel of death came. I bet you Moses stood there and said, wow, I never knew that the blood of a lamb could do this. But you know what? It was symbolic to the blood of the lamb of what? Jesus Christ, because he was that lamb. It's amazing. So isn't it ironic that the same Moses gets the tabernacle and builds the tabernacle inside the people of Israel in their midst? And what was the essence of the tabernacle? It was for the offering of sin. The tabernacle's purpose was basically, let's put it this way. You get a lamb. It's simple. You get a lamb. You lay hands on the lamb. The lamb literally is offered as a sacrificial offering. And the essence of it was to get the blood and take the blood all the way to the holiest of holiest so that you can offer the blood on the mercy seat. Do you see that? So on the mercy seat was this gold plate where you had two angels. And the angels were looking down into the content of the ark. And the ark had the, uh, the, the, the stick of Aaron. Okay, they had manna. And then they had the tablets of Moses. So every time God was looking into the ark, he saw a blood that was speaking a better word than the blood of Elbow speaking what? Mercy. That was it. That was the whole essence of the whole tabernacle. 
Fast forward to 2023, you know, 2023 years ago. Jesus Christ was the lamb which was sacrificed so that his blood can make it all the way into the holiest of holiest. Do you know how I may, I know he made it to the holiest of holiest? Because when we read the scripture, the Bible says in the New Testament, right, that when Jesus Christ died, whatever happened, happened to the holiest of holiest, the curtain was ripped into two. So it's almost like Jesus Christ took his own blood and walked all the way into the holiest of holiest and give us access. What a God. What a God. What a God. What a God. And I pray that, I pray that you're having a deeper understanding and all these things that we're teaching is giving you an encounter, an encounter with the word. It's an encounter with the word and your eyes are opening. Your heart is right and you are just receiving and heeding the word of God and what it is that he wants to do. So listen, it's Easter. We just got done with Easter. We're still in that season. But in 2023, may this other side of the celebration of Easter bring you an encounter where you understand that you are unique. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And if you can get the revelation of what the lamb and the blood can do, you will give your life in full surrender. We shared with you last week that when Mary caught the revelation that this Jesus walking around was the lamb of God who was about to be sacrificed, she poured oil, the Bible says spike nut, very costly oil on the feet of Jesus Christ as if to anoint him for the purpose. And when she caught that revelation, Jesus Christ said something which was very unique. From this day forward, there's nowhere that somebody will mention my name and not mention you, woman. Because she caught the revelation that he is the lamb and he had to be anointed for the purpose of death. That was where he said, it is finished. It is finished. Maybe I should say it in Italian, finito. It's finished. Hold on to that thing. Hold on to that thing. 2023, May, this Passion Week, and what we've just been through, bring a new insight and revelation into your life. You're a child of God, and he is doing everything to kind of indwell in you. He doesn't want to be in tabernacles anymore. He doesn't want to be in temples anymore. He said, I will destroy the temple and build it back in three days. Well, that three days when he came out of the grave, you became that temple. Just let him have you. Let him have your heart. And I believe you'll be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. So listen, I want to pray with you. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I just want to pray with you. Just repeat after me, Father in heaven, we just went through the Passion Week. And I've heard all the stories about Easter. But give me revelational insight into the truth of it. That I will partake about, I will partake of this glorious moment in mankind. When, even though you looked like sin, like how Moses had the serpent on that stick, but I will look deeper and realize that even though you had the form of sin, you were not sin, and you can bring deliverance from the actual suffering that I'm suffering, like how that snake did in those days. I pray in the name of Jesus, oh God. That you accept me, I'll, I'll, I'll accept you into my heart, and I'll be a new person. So God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I thank you that you've given your life to Christ, and that you are going to serve him faithfully moving forward. May your eyes open up to deeper revelation. I love you. SRM, you know we are here. 10 a.m. on Sundays, 7 p.m. on Sunday nights, Friday nights, we are here praying at 8 p.m. And we'll love for you to join us so we pray together. Catch the revelation. Some things are taught. We've taught you. Some things are caught. And I pray that you caught some things here. And some things you just have to believe God and find. And that you find grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Alvin here. I love you. God bless you. See you next time.